I'd like to just provide a very quick introduction for our keynote speaker, who um, is actually speaking here in between conferences um, in a relatively busy schedule. She was at an event apart in Seattle last week, and she'll be speaking at a content strategy meeting in Paris at the end of this week. So we're kind of lucky to shoehorn her in between a couple events. Um, we had to do a little arm twisting, but because she could actually basically walk here from our home, which isn't too far away, it, 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 we, we ended up uh, making it work pretty well. But uh, Christina um, is the founder of her own company, Brain Traffic. She is also the author of a book about content strategy. And um, she's really provided a strong new direction for people like us to not just look at how we're putting things online and how to make it more cool uh, or technologically savvy, but also from a content point of view, maybe just paying attention to what we're putting online as well and how we're formatting it and how we're forming strategies around what we're publishing, essentially, on the web. And so with that intro, I'd like to introduce Christina Helverson, who is our morning keynote speaker this morning. So let me clarify something that Chris just said. I'm not stopping by in between conferences. This is a conference that I'm honored to be speaking at. Um, in fact, I, I'd like to just say that uh, I have had the privilege and opportunity to speak in a lot of different places, places here and in Europe and in Canada um, over the last year. But honestly, this is the first conference I've been invited to speak at in Minnesota for a couple of years. So it was actually a real honor for me to be invited today, and uh, there was very little arm twisting involved. In fact, I was like, how can I schedule my flight out of here late enough in the day that I could come and speak? So I just wanted to be clear and let you guys know that this is, being able to be here and speak to you, my community, is really a, an honor. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, okay. And with that, I have some allergies going on, so if I have to snort in the middle of this, you'll understand why. Um, hello. So as Chris mentioned, I'm the CEO and the founder of, of Brain Traffic. We are located in Minneapolis, and uh, I've been in business with Brain Traffic since about 2002. Hired my first employee in 2005. We're now 16 people. We started out as a web writing agency and have found ourselves sort of magically transformed into a content strategy consultancy, which has made for an interesting ride over the past 12 months. I'm also the author of Content Strategy for the Web. I like it. I think you will too. You should buy it. Okay. <clears throat> I actually also just want to say a word or two about the folks who planned this conference. Uh, Chris actually brought the planning committee to Brain Traffic, and we had lunch um, around our conference table and just kind of talked for a couple of hours, I think, about the ins and outs of planning a conference. I was actually one of the co-founders of the MEMA Summit back in 2002, as a matter of fact. And so I know what it's like to have to create a conference sort of from nothing and with just a grassroots effort. And this is a group of just extraordinarily intelligent, kind, curious, driven people who are really interested in putting on this conference for the good of the community. I mean, just the way that they're able to keep the price point down and the uh, rigorous selection process that they go through for speakers. I'm just really excited and impressed that we have this uh, resource and event for our community. So can we clap for them again? Because they're awesome. <laughs> Okay, who's seen Wally? -E? Everybody has seen Wally. -E. Do we love Wally? -E? Yes, we love it. So, for the four of you in the room who have not seen it, uh, let's talk about it for just a minute. So, let's advance my slides. There we go. So, this is Wally, -E, and uh, in the sort of post-apocalyptic apocalyptic world of Wally, -E, what has happened is this: we, as the human race, have basically trashed the entire planet. Uh, the mountains of junk have piled up so high that there's really sort of no room for us to live and breathe anymore. So what they do is they put everybody on one really big spaceship and they send the entire uh, race of humanity off into space. And behind, they leave thousands, tens of thousands of these little robots, wall -E's. 
And uh, the wall e robots are supposed to uh, basically go around and uh, compact up the junk so that they can kind of clean it up and then we can all return to Earth. Well, of course, what happens is that there is so much crap and so much junk that the robots can't do it, and they all sort of break down one after another, except for our little friend Wally. Now, when I actually look at this pile of trash and the big, gorgeous, junk-laden landscapes of Wall-E, uh, typically what I end up sort of backing away and thinking about is content online. Uh, and it's, it's sort of mind-blowing to me that this is, in fact, the online world that we have created for ourselves. Uh, and yet, this, of course, is where we live. So Wally's job, as we discussed, is to go off and to sort of compact this junk into these little cube squares, right? And um, what I think about when I think about those cubed squares of junk is content on your CMS, where you have put it in and you've packaged it and you have, you know, assigned attributes and it's all really nicely in there and you can, you know, shoot it out to wherever you want, but it's still crap. Uh, I also actually may not be able to see this. I love this, though. This is where I found this photo. New wall e photos leave you in an ice-filled bathtub. Uh, the above image of the eponymous character, ador I, I don't know how to say that word, adorably shuttling a black market kidney to parts unknown. This cracked me up. Drink more coffee. <laughs> so every once in a while, when wall e is out foraging, and packing up this junk, every once in a while he'll find something. He'll find something that's curious, or useful to him, or beautiful, or uh, just something that he enjoys beholding. And uh, it will be a moment of pause for him, and a moment of even revelation and reflection. Uh, and this, of course, is how we feel when we find something that we're looking for online. <laughs> or something that surprises us or delights us. It's something that sort of rises out from the mountains of junk and we feel for a moment satisfied or inspired. And then of course what happens is that Wall E meets this beautiful robot Eve who's sent down to Earth to try to find uh, signs of life. But the minute he gets Eve back to his tractor trailer or whatever it is, uh, he, the first thing he wants to do is show her stuff. He, wants, he starts pulling stuff off the shelves. Look, look what I found, I have this. Do you see this? And that, of course, is how we feel about content online that we love or that has helped us. The immediate urge that we have as a human being is to share this wonderful content. So if content is that precious to us and is that uh, important that we will spend hours and hours and hours of our time online searching for it, working with it, sharing it, posting it, etc., my question is, how is it that we have all come up in our careers over the last 12 to 15 years, and yet content is something that we have somehow allowed to be marginalized in our web development processes? It's something that we have felt within our organizations completely disempowered to have any control over with regard to the quality or even the quantity. And so I, what I want to talk about today is how we as a community can begin to sort of be responsible for, be empowered to, begin to inform the level of quality uh, and relevance and timeliness and accuracy of the content that our agencies and organizations are publishing online to share with our larger online community. So I want to talk about the content problem for just a minute from a very personal perspective. Uh, this is the Hive diagram, and it's something I pulled maybe two years ago now off of this website, skillset.org. And this is by no means a prescriptive measure for how I think every single web project team should be structured, but it is a good jumping off point for any conversation around roles and responsibilities of our web project teams. So uh, in 1999, I started out as a copywriter and uh, very quickly became enamored of sort of the nuances and the uh, complexities and opportunities of writing for the online experience. So I started calling myself a web writer, even though I didn't really know what that meant, but that was really exciting to people. So I got started, I started getting called for web projects, which was awesome. Um, 
so what I want to clarify too, I think is important in this, in this conversation is that it's highly unlikely that most of you, if any of you actually have the luxury of being one of these things, you know, as, as a web writer, I kind of often ended up taking on these responsibilities. Even if I, even if I weren't, if, even if I wasn't prepared to actually take them on a lot of UX designers, maybe have all of these sort of, you know, roles and, and responsibilities and hats that they wear. Some of you may not have any control over the fact that you have to do all those things, you know, and then sometimes of course, one of us may be responsible for all of these things together. And then sometimes this may be you. <coughs> so, I just wanted to clarify that. So anyway, here, here I was. And whenever I would enter into the project process, typically this is kind of how I found that the web teams were, were structured. R rarely, rarely was there, uh, did we ever have the luxury of having a web editor, a person who was sort of working between me and the rest of the web project team. Uh, I'm sorry, or a content strategist. Uh, nor did we typically have a web editor. Uh, web analyst, or SEO specialist, we usually didn't have that person either. Usually I was the one towards the end of the project. They were like, right, can you go try to figure out some good keywords and kind of plug those into the metadata because we forgot about those and this will be the last minute. Especially like seven, eight years ago, this was not really on many people's radars. And who are we kidding? We didn't have those people either. So this is where I usually sat on project teams. And so this is how this would usually go down. Far before they ever called me, everybody would sit down around a conference room and they'd be like, okay, we've got this new web project, we have all these great opportunities, and they'd pull out the whiteboards and they'd start doing blue sky thinking, and everybody would be really excited about the new visual design and the new CMS and all these opportunities, and of course what nobody was really talking about was where the content was going to come from, who was going to take care of the content, when it was going to be created, how much time it was going to take, etc. But that was a very boring topic. So we would move on to user personas because those are really exciting and fun storytelling. We'd talk about our visual design standards. We'd pay the agency a lot of money for that. Uh, we would go into user flows and task flows because that's we all really love to sort of talk about that and test those. We'd finally get to this site map where it would look, you know, we'd start to get an idea of how the site was going to get laid out and structured and we'd all start feeling really excited. <laughs> Like, okay, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, and this is going to be great, and hey, all right, I can just, you know, I can feel, I'm going to be able to start sleeping through the night soon, and they'd be like, okay, let's stop, let's take a look at the schedule, kind of look and see where they were, and then they'd say, okay, it's time for the copywriting. We've gotten kind of the design phase, so we really, we should call the copywriter. So they'd call me and they'd sit me down and they'd say, okay, Christina, thanks for coming in. Listen, here's the creative brief that we came up with about 14 weeks ago. Um, here are the technical specifications. You're going to need to go through that and pull out the error messages so that you can maybe try, try to write those. Here's the content inventory. We've just kind of done the shell of that. So if you can kind of go through the wireframes and figure out what else needs to be put in there. And here's your source material on the server. You should be able to find most of what you need in there. Uh, we haven't filled the document templates on and on and on and on and on. We're going to need to see a first draft in about a week and a half. <laughs> I was a copywriter. I did not have the skills or the context or the time or the experience to be able to take these piles and piles of documentation and begin to create content that was going to be even remotely meaningful or on, on brand or voice or tone for all of these different audiences. It was overwhelming to me. And here, I think, is what would happen and what continues to happen even today. We get to this point in our web project processes at the beginning couple of weeks in, several more weeks in, and what we tell ourselves is, well, you know, the client is really the subject matter expert. We have provided them with what we're going to need from them, and it's up to them to take care of it. They should be able to because they're the subject matter experts. Or uh, we already have most of what we, are, what we need. It's online somewhere. We can just go pull it down, and it'll be fine. We'll just port it over. Or, oh, we've run out of time and budget. We'll just go ahead and roll this over to the new site, and we'll fix it later. Uh, or another one that has I've really enjoyed over the last couple of years, which is we're going to just go bare bones with our content because we think the users are going to create the content for us. <laughs> Here's where I think one of the roots of our problem is. This is copywriting. This is how we perceive and understand copywriting, which is how we have done it for the last several decades. We get our concept or we get our topics, we draft. 
We send it into the editor. The editor revises it. We do our revisions. We send it back. It gets approved. It gets published. And it's gone. And I, as a copywriter, got paid and got to walk away. But the difference here is that this is content. This is a, this is a, a very ugly and for a reason um, diagram of, that this guy f uh, put together of the sort of seven cycles, uh, seven stages of the content life cycle. And this is the whole difference, which is that our content actually does have a life cycle. It's not something that we create and then publish and can forget about the way that we've been doing for decades with print and radio and TV and direct mail and all of these other uh, media that we can create and push and then it's done. Content is, in fact, something that has uh, a life. It's something that goes online and that... Uh, goes live, and we say that for a reason, because it's something that needs to continually evolve over time. So I want to spend just a minute providing a little bit of historical uh, context for how it is that we got here. So did anybody go to the IA Summit this past week in Phoenix? No, okay. <laughs> so this is Richard Saul Warman. Do you, does anybody know who he is? A couple of people. So he's a guy, he's written like 84 books or something, I don't, literally. He, he, though, is the, is the man in the early 70s who actually came up with the phrase information architecture. The reason I asked if anybody went to the IA Summit is that this guy was just a serious hero of mine. Like, I, I just, I, I had the opportunity to see him in Chicago late last year, and literally he, t he came on stage and I got teary because this is just a guy that has, he's also a co-founder of the TED conferences, um, literally, like, just overwhelmed by the presence of this man. And he came on stage and proceeded to give the single worst talk I've ever seen in my entire life. It was like the most irresponsible, self-aggrandizing, horrible 50 minutes I've ever spent. And the lesson I took from that is to never meet your heroes. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it was fun to, he spoke at the IA Summit the last weekend and it was fun to kind of watch people react from afar because it was pretty much the same thing. Oh my God, there he is. Oh my God, what's happening? Anyway... So this is actually a quote from him less than a year ago. Uh, why, why he actually came up with the phrase information architecture, which I should mention is something that was really grabbed onto by library scientists. Yes, this is what we have needed. We have needed systems and structures so that people can begin to find and work with this information. But here's what I think is really interesting about this quote, which is that he says there are thousands of people using the term, but 90% of them aren't doing what I think they should be doing anyway. What does that mean? Let's continue. So this is Edward Tufte, and Edward Tufte began, right? I know, those books look so good on my coffee table. <laughs> uh, so he began, he, these books were published in the 80s, and here's what Edward Tufte did. Edward Tufte gave us these gorgeous books showing how visual design over the ages really was a very, very powerful medium in which to communicate large amounts of data and information. And by really compiling all of this information together in these, in these few publications, what he did was he empowered visual designers in a brand new way to take on the role of communicator, to take on the role of instructor and educator. So this was a huge sort of breakthrough and revelation for graphic designers all over the world, and it continues to inspire us as designers and interaction designers and web professionals. Um, just in showing that the vis visual medium does not need to equal pretty pictures. It can also be a very, very powerful, complex form of communication. Then came user experience. And Jesse James Garrett wrote The Elements of User Experience in 2000. And if you haven't read this book, I strongly recommend doing it. It's just kind of one of those things that you really want to have in your uh, arsenal of, of education and reference. Um, so what Jesse James Garrett did was he basically said, okay, we keep talking about this amorphous thing called user experience because the web is more than just a technical medium. It's more than just a visual medium, which... In the early days of the web, th that's how we understood it. So it was up to our visual designers and our back-end tech folks and our front-end tech folks to create our websites. And what Jesse was able to do is to say there's more to it than that because when we go online, we're not just looking and interacting. We're actually going through this information and we're using it and we're having an online experience. So what he did was he broke down the different components of user experience and sort of how, how he proposed that the design, uh, user experience design, 
phase went. And there's two aspects to this. He goes from the abstract user needs and site objectives to the concrete, which is the visual design. And uh, then from on the right side, he talks about from conception and time over to completion. It's funny because since then, he's like, well, I never meant for this to be a process definition. And I'm like, well, then you should have left time off of the right side of the diagram. <laughs> <coughs> So the thing to notice here is that what we do, we start with our user objectives, and then does everybody, do people recognize their own web design and, and project processes within this diagram? Some people. Uh, I still see this posted in cubicles and in presentations, like everywhere I go. Um, but basically, if you'll note, from user, we, we go to functional specifications and content requirements, and then content kind of disappears through the rest of it. We get to what content do we need really early on, but then it just kind of goes away. And interestingly, what he says here is that the model outline here doesn't account for secondary considerations like content. And what this, was, what this uh, enabled user experience designers to do is to sort of abdicate responsibility for the content, to say, well, I design experiences. Yeah, right, And so the content itself is something that just will sort of magically get uploaded when we take our dollies into the content warehouse and pile all the content on and then go upload it to the server in the sky. And here's the problem, which is that Jesse w really went through and kind of worked to define user experience design as software development. But the problem is this, which is that content isn't a feature. Content isn't something that we can just make a list and just sort of check those boxes off. Okay, we've gotten that piece, we've gotten that piece, we've gotten that PDF. Because content is complex. And content is something not just within the life cycle, but also it is how we are communicating primarily to our users online. And not just in text, but also with the video and the audio. Now, granted, I do tend to talk about text more than I do everything, than I do the video and the audio and the images because we have established methodologies for those. We have established processes for recording something or shooting a video. But when it comes to actually developing and caring for content, textual content online and making it findable and relevant and keeping it accurate and consistent, we don't really have those processes in place because we are still thinking of content as something that we can do and check off or that somebody can check off and that we can just sort of send off and that it'll be done. But content is a living, breathing, evolving thing that everybody can do and everybody can touch, which is how we get to the world of Wall-E. Um, so the good news is that over the past year, I would say there has been this explosion of interest in this thing called content strategy, which I talk about every once in a while. Um, and by that, I mean all day, every day. Um, the reason I think that the industry has been so quick to embrace this, and not just writers who are just like, thank God, I finally am more than a, just a copywriter in a cubicle. I mean, that has definitely been part of it. But also because we, ha we are all so tired of seeing our beautiful stuff that we have put our blood, sweat, and tears into go online and get populated with crap. And, you know, just saying, oh, this is not what I envisioned at all. Or if we're freelancers or agencies saying, oh, I, you know, I just don't want to include that in my portfolio because it's just riddled with spelling errors and lots of, like, me, me, all about me, more about my company, let's talk more about me. And so this is, this is a, a methodology and an opportunity and even just a way of thinking that's being really embraced and sort of uh, hungrily devoured by all different levels and types of roles within uh, our community of people who make things online. So let's talk for a little bit then about what this m magical, mythical uh, beast content strategy is. So content strategy, this is another thing. This is something, it's not like anybody just invented this. This has been happening for the last, you know, 12, 15 years. It's just that nobody's been talking about it. Um, because it's been perceived as really boring, but it's not. It's super sexy. Let's talk about it now. Um, so content strategy is a, is a practice that plans for the creation, the publication, or the delivery, and the governance of content, uh, useful, usable content. And I want to talk about this word governance because I, I chose to use this word in particular specifically because we've all talked about content maintenance for a long time, but I take my car in for maintenance 
you know, it, maintenance is something that you can automate. Maintenance is something that our CMS vendors have been promising us that they'll take care of for a really long time. But governance implies actual human oversight. Governance implies that we are we're being responsible for and taking care of our content with, with a human eye and not just with robots that are going to check to make sure that the keyword population is still um, working for us. So again, this is what we talk about when we talk about content. It's our whole world of content that we need to be keeping an eye on. And I've already kind of talked about why I talk about text and data. Oh, I should also mention that when I talk about um, text, I'm not just talking about like marketing copy, right? I mean, that's the easy stuff for me to kind of be able to point to and use as examples. But this is content online. And we all touch this at some point during our day. And so as back-end or front-end developers or visual designers or user experience designers, we're all dealing with some type of data. Uh, specifically, when we're talking about the usability component with task instructions, forms, uh, functional specs with our error messages, which I find that oftentimes developers are stuck with writing at the last minute, metadata, alt heads, et cetera. These are all things that need to be coherently and cohesively planned for at the beginning of the project process. How often does that happen? Never. Let's change it. Yeah. Okay. So then strategy, this is a word that we kind of argue about all the time at brain traffic. Um, but this is how I like to talk about it because I'm a pragmatist and I, I can talk about big ideas for a certain period of time, but then I want something to get done. So when I talk about strategy, I talk about it as being a plan for obtaining a specific goal or result, but basically it becomes a roadmap from where you are now, identifying where it is that you want to be and then how you're going to get there. It's not tactics. And that, I think, is another issue, is that we often jump from, here's our high-level strategy, to tactics, which ends up just kind of being this like buckshot approach of a bunch of stuff that we can do now. This is actually, it's a roadmap, right? And so in order to get to where you want to be, you have to understand exactly where it is now, because, where you are now, because otherwise, how can you get accurate directions? And what's the terrain going to look like as you go? What are the best things to use to get there? What are, what's the weather going to be like along the way, et cetera? So this is how I talk about strategy. Uh, so in fact, we're not, and a lot of times when I read about content strategy online, when people talk about it initially, they're like, our content strategy is that we're going to launch a blog and we're going to open up a Twitter stream and we're going to put a bunch of case studies up and then that becomes their content strategy. That's not a strategy. That's just talking about what you want to do. And it's really easy to talk about what it is that we want to do. This is actually the list of questions that content strategy answers. And it's basically just all of those great journalistic questions that we were taught to ask early in our careers. Not, not just what are we going to put up, but why are we doing it in the first place? I swear, if we would ask this question in our project process, why are we publishing this? Like half of our content would immediately go away. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, how is it going to get done? Not just we're going to have the client do this and so here's when it's due, cross our fingers, hope for the best, but actually what does that editorial workflow look like? What's the source content that we have to work with? Where does that live? Is it any good? Who exactly are we publishing and delivering this content for? Where are they? What do they want from it? Who's going to do it? What do we have to work with? When is it going to be delivered? Where are we going to deliver it? How often are we going to deliver it? And then most importantly or partially, what happens after we get that content online? This is another huge question that rarely gets asked. So if this then is the world of content strategy, it's the plan that's getting lost. We go from high level strategy to tactics. And this is, it's a time consuming thing. And it's something that's going to require us to really back up and take a look at how our organizations are even structured and where our roles and responsibilities are allocated. So this is not a quick fix to anything, but it really does require us to change the way we think about creating things for the web. So let's talk briefly about how it helps. Is that clock correct back there? One time I was speaking and the clock was stopped and like 40 minutes after I was supposed to after I was supposed to finish, I was like, "Wow, I've been how this is great. I'm talking really fast." And I was like, they'd let me talk right through their break, which made me feel terrible and confused. Um, so so okay, so let's talk about how it helps. So this is this is Quicken online, and it is they recently redid their homepage, but really at the end of the day, they just kind of moved some elements around. So when you look at this initially. 
this looks like a pretty well-designed web page, right? I mean, there's lots of nice open white space, and it's kind of designed on the grid, and, and you know, there are that many different types of fonts, and there's a pretty clear call to action. But now let's take a step back. Your money life is a mess, and you are tired of losing sleep over it. You are tired of feeling anxious about it. You are tired of wondering why your credit card bill was that high last month, and you have decided that it is time to take control of your finances. And you want to feel calm and confident and in control and smart. And so you decide that you are going to invest the time and money into finding a personal financial software to help you get your money stuff together. Now look at this page. Is there anything on there that is helping you feel like Quicken is maybe the answer to your problems? Is there anything on there that begins to tell you which Quicken product might be right for you? Three. <laughs> uh, the, I, I am fascinated that the fact that the, you know, almost half of the real estate is taken up by box shots of these products. Who thought it was a good idea to put those box shots up there? Marketing. Price points, calls to action but nothing here to speak to you about where you are emotionally. And money is a very, very emotional matter. Uh, let's compare this to mint.com. Now take a look. Everywhere you look on this page, you see calm and happy and fresh and green. You also see yourself. Uh, the primary nav here, it's kind of is, there's not very good contrast, so I'll read it. The primary nav right along here is understand your money, all your accounts in one place, easy budgeting tools, find instant savings, and 24 financial, 24 7 financial protection. And these are actually the five primary decision making uh, points that Mint's target audience will refer to when they are trying to make a choice about a personal financial software product. Down below, how can Mint help you live a richer life? Get it? Um, save for retirement, pay off your debt, pay your student loans, buy a car. These are the four main life events or triggers that will uh, drive a potential client to the Mint.com site. So this is just, and then look at how the design works with it. I mean, this sign up in under five minutes, it sets expectations, it makes it look easy, and it's the only really uh, strong orange element in the entire uh, page. So this is a really lovely example of content strategy actually being executed uh, in a way that is really harmonious with the design. And of course, I've been using this example for almost a year now, so you can imagine how uh, good it made me feel when Quicken uh, Intuit actually acquired Mint. <laughs> uh, quickly now here too, this is actually a more detailed wireframe so that if you actually can find your products and services uh, link on quicken.com, this is, and this is, you know, a very nice wireframe. This is something that I'm sure many of us have produced and actually seen. Uh, and in fact, as a writer, I have been handed wireframes that look much like this uh, many, many, many times over my career. And then I will get my assignment from uh, marketing and project managers and legal and uh, the, you know, EVP of marketing or whatever, and then this is what that page will end up looking like. And this again is what keeps happening to our designs because we don't have anyone who really is empowered to say no or anyone who is able to say, you know, if this is what this is going to look like, we really need to work through to make sure that we're identifying the three primary benefits that people actually care about. Okay. This is another I'll skim over this one, but this is another one. So I've searched for how do I sync my bank accounts, and here are the top search results. What if I receive a message telling me that my bank accounts are not in sync? Mint from the makers of Quicken. Quicken Online is now mint.com. Importing your Microsoft. There's nothing here that even begins to answer my question. And this is a metadata fail, right? Because the metadata is not being planned for or managed alongside of the content development and delivery. So remember we talk about the govern piece? 
my favorite example. So this is Swiffer on YouTube, which I know why is Swiffer on YouTube. Uh, but this is the official Swiffer channel, which they're still paying to sponsor. So when you get here, you, you, you click over through this and it says ready to leave your feather duster in the dust. Now this is a great campaign that some agency came up with that was like, hey, we're going to get some user generated content. We're really going to engage people in the Swiffer brand and we know people love it. So let's launch this and people can win $15,000 plus some free Swiffers or whatever it is that they were giving away. And this contest ended almost two years ago. And this is still what's up there. I keep going back to check and it's still there. It's like the problem that keeps on giving. And what we see is a broken graphic. We see uh, the winning video with pretty much no context. We see um, <clears throat> the, the uh, promo description. We also see that the last time anybody from Swiffer signed in was nine months ago. This is Swiffer's brand presence on YouTube. And people still stumble across it. I mean, you go into this property and you see comments like, hello. <laughs> what is this? So let's just take a minute to talk about who's really doing this well. And again, this is focusing on the execution piece of content strategy, but great content doesn't happen by accident. Great content happens when we're all as a team empowered to be able to have the tools and the time and the say and, the, uh, and provide the perspective that's going to get this great content published. So REI.com, I love going to REI and buying things because it makes me feel more fit. So this is REI's mission statement. And I has mo have most people shopped at REI for one reason or another. So here's the main thing that I want to point out. One of the great things about going in and shopping at REI is that you can go in and just feel like, ah, you know, I have never gone on a hike in my life and I'm pretty sure I shouldn't wear my new balance. Like what, what do you recommend that I buy? And they'll be able to say, well, you know, I actually tried these or I've been talking to customers or last time I went on a hike. And so these are people that actually really are passionate about the outdoors. They don't just market it, they actually are, right? And so you can go in there and, and this, their mission statement actually, you'll see it in action in their stores where, the, where their employees are experts and they can offer actual first person feedback on the gear that they sell. So when you go online to REI.com, they have devoted a, a section of their website to expert advice. Um, and what's great about this is that there are maybe 300, 350 articles. So it's not like a database of like 22,000 things, everything you would ever in a million years want to know about being outside. It's a finite number of articles that's very well architected uh, in sort of the primary areas of interest that they've identified that their customers and, and main audiences have. The other thing that's important is that they create this content. They don't aggregate it from somewhere else. They don't hire freelancers to do it. They actually call upon their green vests and their very small uh, staff of content strategists and web editors, which I think last time I talked to them, there were like four people, maybe five, but they have an editorial calendar and they have actually governance standards and policies and they have um, user and audience research that identifies what the big questions are that people are asking. They use keyword research to identify it. Uh, they do field research in their stores. So they've actually committed internally resources to be able to create and care for this content. They treat their content like it's a valuable business asset, which it ends up being online. There it is. Room and board. I use this example all over the world and wherever there is a room and board. Does anybody here work at room and board? Wherever there is based here, right? And wherever there is a room and board store, I pull this up and people just explode in applause, which is pretty gay. So, great. So go Minneapolis. Um, here is room and boards sort of about us mission statement, uh, their competitive differentiator. And one of the big things that they push is that they don't just go out and get their furniture from some big manufacturer in China or Bali or wherever it is that my mom likes to just tell me that her sofa was made. Um, this is what they talk about, which is that their furniture is actually handcrafted some of it, uh, but that they work with these artisans, people that actually have been making furniture for decades, for generations, to come up with the designs at least, or sometimes even the furniture itself that's being constructed. So 
that's fine for them to tell you that. And for a long time, they did. They just kind of told us over and over in their catalog, and maybe they showed pictures. But what they've done in their ideas and advice section is that they've actually brought these stories to life. So that they are taking the time and spending the money to go out and actually interview these artisans and craftsmen um, and to uh, take these photos and to really tell stories about the people that are delivering their products and their services. Uh, they have two writers on staff, maybe three at this point, um, who are also responsible for everything from the catalog to the in-store signage. Again, they're not cranking this stuff out, like seven articles a week, but they're doing it on a very planned, carefully uh, resource allocated basis to bring their stories to life online. So, at this point, <laughs> at this point in the, in the uh, talk, a lot of people, especially when I'm speaking to uh, folks who have all these different roles on web teams, some people have just kind of checked out. They're just like, you know what? Even if I had anything to say about this, nobody would listen to me, or I've been complaining about this forever, or, um, uh, you know, whatever. This is just not my deal, and this is nice, and there were some funny jokes, but I'm out. Right? Let's get on to the CSS conversation. But, <laughs> you know, as I said before, we all touch content. At some point during our project processes, we all touch content at some level. And so, and even sort of the smallest nuances can affect how our content is communicated visually. It can affect how our content is found or not found. Uh, it can affect how heavily the content is edited during the QA process. Um, it can affect whether or not we're able to find the relevant source content that we need uh, when we redo certain sections of the site. If we're designing a CMS, it can have effect on how soon uh, our technology points to pages or pieces of content that need to be reviewed. Hello, I see your flip cam right there. Hi. <laughs> Hey. It'd be one thing if you just had it up the whole talk, but it's like every once in a while it's just like. <laughs> it's, his it's his content strategy to disconcert me. It's working. You've allocated the appropriate resources to distract me. <laughs> Folks, no matter what your role is, at the agency level, at the corporate level, even if you're a freelancer, the minute you touch anything that's going to go online, you become a publisher. And you've got to start thinking like a publisher. Because these are not products that we craft and that we're finished with and that we send off into the ether. These are products where once we send them out there, they're out there. And people can access them, they can take them, they can rework them, they can share them, they can read them, they can complain about them, they can make fun of them. And so in, in that sense, you can't act like a lone cowboy because publishers depend on other people to ensure that their final product is coherent and that it is relevant and that it has impact and that it tells a good story that people are going to want to read and share with other people. So I want to touch real quickly. I have, what, two minutes? Where's Chris? I can never remember how much time I have. Okay, well, I'm just going to keep talking. 40 minutes later. So these are the quick things that I want to provide to you guys as a few takeaways for how you can begin to care for your content, which is the reason that we all build stuff online. You can audit it. This is a content inventory. How many of you have seen one of these before? How many of you have done a content audit before? How many of you loved doing that content audit? You did? Come see me after. <laughs> I have cookies for you. As for the rest of you, I don't care. You need to do it anyway. You've got to understand what you have, what your world of content is before you can start to make changes. If you work at the University of Minnesota, you have 200,000 billion pages of content. You are not going to be able to go in here and hand count those pages. However, 
it is on you to begin to figure out a long-term plan for wrangling that content because it's out there and you keep publishing more and it's not going away and your problem's just going to get bigger and Wally is not going to save you from that. So begin to ask for and allocate resources to at least begin to try to get your problem under control or get your arms around what it is before you start deciding to redesign the homepage again because that's not going to help nor is a CMS, a new CMS. The second thing is you can begin to ask. No matter who you are within the project process or where you are, you can ask these questions. It doesn't always mean that you're going to get an answer. It doesn't always mean that you're going to like an, the answer. But the thing is, you'll begin to uh, get people thinking about these questions specifically as they pertain to content. And again, that is a huge uh, mind shift from where we have been, because these are the questions that we tend to race on past as we're thinking about our technology and our visual and our code. The third thing is to analyze. So remember, this is your content life cycle. So we need to start thinking about all the different components that exist within this life cycle uh, and what, our, what the impact factors are both internally and externally that can touch our content and, have a, and affect it at any point in time during this process. Here's the other thing that we need to audit, our people. Because this is another thing that we tend to sort of gloss over when we're thinking about content development. We just assume that everybody has the time and the tools and the perspective and the context to get it done. But in reality, everybody is still kind of doing web content on top of everything else. This is like what they have to, this is like, oh, by the way, here's this new part of your job that you're not going to get a raise and you're just going to stay after work to do it. So people are actually kind of bitter about having to do web content a lot of the time. So it's important that we begin to talk to them and that we understand their obstacles, that we hear their ideas and their perspectives because they're the ones that are on the front lines with this content. And they're the ones that are going to see opportunity at the same time. They are also the ones that are going to believe that, yes, in fact, they do need these 400 pages to tell uh, the about us story. And that, in fact, yes, we do need to publish the entire annual report in HTML, uh, you know, with whatever. Like, people don't care about that. They do. And so we've got to make sure that they are heard, but we also need to make sure that we have some kind of a firm strategy in place and governance policies and standards in place so that when we do say no, when someone is finally empowered to say no, that we have reasons for saying no. And it's not just because that's a dumb idea. Uh, the fourth thing we need to do is align. So this is where we're going. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's probably not even going to happen next year. I mean, what we're talking about now with content strategy is a very similar conversation that we were having, uh, that information architects were starting 10 years ago, uh, where they were like, hey, we matter too, and structure is important, and everybody was like, whatever, look at Flash. Uh, <laughs> So this is really the, the paradigm. I'm going to bust out that word once. It's the only time I will use it. But this is what we're working towards, which is where we have invested in and we have identified a plan for our content. And that content is something that we begin to care for in a cyclical fashion, that we've actually committed full-time ongoing resources for and not just sort of the continuing uh, buckshot, okay, we're going to pay attention to this content and then we'll get back to it later. And then this is the fifth thing, and this is what we've been talking about pretty much the entire time since I've been up here, which is that we need to start, if we want our end product to get any better, if we want our users' experiences to get any better, we need to begin assuming responsibility. We need to actually begin to call out, oh, yeah, this sentence structure sucks. And even though I'm, you know, in the coding process, I'm just going to fire this off to my team lead and sort of say, is this really what we're publishing? Can you just, you just want to check with somebody? You may never hear back. But you've, you've put in your little, you put in your little two cents, you know, they've noted, oh, something fell down in the QA process. And that's, that's what we need to do to just get the conversation started. I'm not asking for any necessarily huge sweeping changes unless you uh, are a manager that can actually change process, in which case come see me because I have words for you. Um, but, you know, if you are, if you, and this is the majority of the audiences I speak to feel incredibly disempowered about content, even if they are the ones creating content. But we all need to come together and begin to take responsibility for our content quality and for the resources that are being allocated. We just have to start the conversation. That's all I'm asking for today. And what do you get? Oh. 
One of the big challenges and one of the big sort of holy grails right now within the ever-growing content strategy community is being able to specifically tie content strategy efforts to the business's bottom line. Because at the end of the day, the CMO does not care if fixing the content is the right thing for the end user. They really don't. They want to know how it's either going to make or save them money. So this is the other key thing. Everybody's measures of success within their departments, within their organizations are different. But it becomes then our job, however small our content initiative, to begin to tie the results of that, to begin to be able to measure the results of that and tie those to our bottom line business uh, objectives. This is not, there's not going to be any, it's hard, right? Like this is why C, uh, SEO is so huge because everybody can just be like, hey, look at, this is how many page hits you got or you're number three in the rankings. It's really easy to measure. But at the end of the day, like you can make data to say whatever it is that you want, right? So do that for content strategy. This then <laughs> is the world that we're working towards. We want a world where things are clean and free and we can go online and we don't feel inundated by a bunch of crap showing up in the search engines or we can go to uh, the website of someone who is providing a service or a product that we might need and we can feel confident and we can feel calm and we can feel clear on the fact that the content that we find is going to help support us in a decision or will inform us or maybe even will delight us. Thank you so much for having me.